Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm Bianca from the NHSR team. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm delighted to say we have Anna Yu, who is going to take you through introduction to R and our studio. And he is Senior Epidemiologist at Hertfordshire County Council. We also have Ruth Keane, who has kindly agreed to co-host. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Anna. Enjoy. Thank you, Bianca. Um, yeah. So I think. Oh, did you give me the permissions yet? Because I can't. Okay. Thank you. All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, Bianca has kindly introduced. I'm Amy. I'll be teaching the course today and um, I won't have great access to the chat. So if you have any questions that you want to pop into the chat, then uh, Ruth will be monitoring the chat and answering any questions. And uh, if there's anything, I'm sure she'll, um, you know, interrupt me and then let me know uh, if there's anything that should be discussed that's in the comment section. Um, yeah, so the meeting will be recorded. So if you're uncomfortable with having your voice or face in the video, then you can just ask your questions in the chat. But if you don't mind, then feel free to interrupt me at any time. You know, I, I love hearing other people's voices. Um, I'm quite sick of hearing mine personally. So please do feel free to interrupt me at any point if you want to just know something or if you have any quick tips that you want to get to the rest of the class as well. That's great. Um, that's happened before and it's been very useful. So can I confirm that everybody has had a link to join the Posit Cloud workspace or have had their RStudio locally set up, whichever one you're planning to use. If you don't have RStudio installed locally, then you can just refer to the link that was sent to you by email. If you don't have this link, can you please raise your hand using uh, the, the Zoom reaction or pop in the chat? If you haven't received it, I can resend it just so that nobody's missing out. I'm not seeing, okay, I see one person. So let me send that link through. So I think, I think if you click on that link, you should be prompted to join a workspace. Just say yes to joining the workspace. Um, if you don't have an account in Posit Cloud, <clears throat> sorry, please quickly register. It shouldn't take that long. Um, but once you've done that, uh, join the workspace, please. And then I will kind of show you the interface and how to proceed. Uh, and also, Forgive me if I start like clearing my throat or like coughing because I've caught, I've unfortunately caught that bug that's been going around with uh, the sore throats and the, the coughing, which is why I'm teaching at home today. Remote working, guys. <laughs> um, okay, I'll start sharing my screen. Share my entire screen. Right. Yeah. So I think everybody can see this. If you can't see my screen, I'm currently on Posit Cloud. If you can't see that, please let me know. But yeah, once you're in the workspace on the sidebar, it should have NHSR intro somewhere on the side to your left and just click on it just to refresh it. And then it'll take you to a page that looks like this. Um, if you don't see this after clicking on the link, then you might not have agreed to join the workspace yet, or you didn't have an account. If you have other issues, please let me know, though, if you don't see the screen. Hello. Hi. Hi. There's a question from um, someone in the chat, which might be worth clarifying. It's... um. Do, yeah. Does anyone need to install our studio locally or is it all going to be happening in the cloud? Um, 
I would advise against doing the installation now because it will be a bit time consuming uh, and we don't want to um, spend too much time debugging. So at this point, I think it's faster to join the POSIT cloud. But if anybody else has set up RStudio locally in advance, then please feel free to use that instead. And just make sure that you have had like the downloaded data sets um, installed. Uh, it should be in the installation instructions. Um, if you didn't see that, that's fine. Just use POSIT Cloud. It should all be the same content, the same functionality. Yeah, hopefully that helps. OK, uh, any other issues related to accessing POSIT Cloud? So what you currently see here, or uh, any local RStudio things that you would like to bring up? I'm taking silence as a no, which is great. All right, so I will stop uh, my camera because this is a little bit distracting to me while I teach. So now we can start the course. So if you're on Posit Cloud, which I feel like most people are using it just for ease, um, it is essentially kind of a web-based version of RStudio. So it's by the same company. So you don't need to worry about the fact that it's uh, you know, by a different company, it's the same company. So you're using the same product, essentially. If you're working on Posit Cloud instead of local R, um, you are getting essentially the same thing. The difference is that this is on a web-based browser version on the cloud, um, but you can also install RStudio as a software that you can just use in your local PC. So that's the only difference. Hopefully that clears it up. Um, but once you're here, uh, there is already a RStudio project here called Intro RStudio with start at the side. So just click on that. And then there will be a loading bar that will take a minute or two. If it's as slow as what you're seeing here, that means that it's working essentially. So don't worry too much about that. Once it's done though, you'll essentially just have like a, a copy of the template that we've made for you for this course. So the template has some data sets pre-installed, some packages pre-installed. I'll go through what all of those mean in a second. Um, but it just makes the course a little bit speedier because you already have the materials uh, ready for you in the, in the template. So once it's done deploying the project, you'll see this interface. Um, you can remove the sidebar by clicking on the little icon here. So it gives you a little bit more space. Um, and you should see these pre-installed data sets on the side. If you do not have these pre-installed data sets, please flag in the comments or speak up, but ideally you should. If you don't, then I advise you to go back to the NHSR intro workspace and then click on the project with uh, Zoe Turner's name at the bottom. Otherwise, if you go out, when you come back in, just make sure that you click on the one that has your name under it because that is your copy of Zoe's template. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back in. And yeah, so at this point, I'm not going to check chat that often. So um, yeah, if there are any uh, questions, I trust that Ruth will answer them. If not, Ruth will black me, and then I'll I'll take a look. Um, so yeah, let's let's get started. I'm gonna bring up the slides now. So, introduction to R and R Studio. You're probably here because you've heard that it's a great tool, a great analytical tool, great tool for um, automation, data visualization, data wrangling, modeling. You know all these fancy things. Unfortunately, we will be doing modeling today but we'll just be giving you the building blocks so that you can start your journey into using R and coding in R. Right, this, this is the uh, agenda. And, you know, we won't really have a lunch break because we split this course into two. Um, the next half will be next week. So, but we will be having a break. So I won't, <laughs> and I don't think I can, talk for like three hours straight without needing a break either. So 
The course aims are as follows. We just want to show you some of the possibilities, give you a feel of how R works, how the R Studio interface looks like, and to show you enough for you to begin teaching yourself because there are free resources available aside from this coursework that um, is going to be uploaded on YouTube, I believe. There's loads of free tutorials online that you could further your learning after this. So elegant graphics, you might've heard that our studio can produce, well, R can produce a lot of excellent data visualizations for your uh, data analytical needs. One example being this, uh, a plot for timelines of COVID-19 cases in English local authorities. Um, this would be very hard to replicate in Excel, for example, but this is the kind of stuff that you can do and then automate in R. What I mean by automate is that you run this once and then you can give the code, sorry about that. You can give the code to your colleague and then they can run it and they will get the exact same result without needing to download a huge Excel file and then going through all the operations of like, well, rerunning all the queries in the Excel files. So that's one example. Uh, this is another one. You can also do very beautiful maps with R, with R, but we won't be mapping today. It's just to kind of give you a sense of the possibilities of what you could do. And sometimes I mix up R and R Studio. It's because R Studio, I, I will be going through this later, but R Studio is kind of the interface where you use R. So sometimes I kind of use them interchangeably, but we'll get down into the difference in a second. So R is really good for collaboration. As I said, you could, it's all code based. So if you write a piece of code that produces a plot or produces a table or produces a clean piece of uh, data, data set, they could give that code to your colleague, they run it, they will get the same product. So this is great for collaboration, for sharing code. Um, obviously reproducibility is a given as well. And then R Markdown is kind of just another way of using R. So it's, uh, it's kind of like a template where you can build documents and dashboards with R using R Markdown. Again, we'll be covering all this in detail, so don't worry too much if you, um, if my explanation doesn't make sense yet. Automated reports. I love this about R. Um, you can generate these automated reports and then give the code to your colleague and they will generate these automated reports. So essentially, um, you can put in tables, graphs, all these like nifty widgets, interactive elements into the R Markdown document, run it. You know, you can even schedule the running on a daily, weekly, annual basis, and then you should be able to produce updated results with updated data and, you know, the same kind of uh, reporting template each time. So this is very, very powerful, especially for my work as a senior epidemiologist. Um, we use automated reports all the time and we build new ones every, every month, essentially, um, for different products. We also uh, make a lot of interactive dashboards a lot. So dashboards can be both made in R Markdown, which we will cover, but you can also make shiny applications that are even more interactive and reactive dashboards. We won't be going to shiny dashboards, but they are kind of the next step. They're a little bit more intermediate slash advanced R level. So we won't be covering it this course, but I'm sure that there will be other workshops that cover uh, shiny dashboards. So um, in this slide, there is a link to an interactive dashboards, which I can send into the chat. We want to see the level of interactivity that you can reach with R, then just follow that link. You know, you've got uh, drop down menus that you can click on. You've got tabs, whoops. You've got different tabs that lead to different pages, uh, some of which lead to pages with plots that take a little while to load. I'm not sure if this dashboard is up to date yet. Oh, there we go. You've got these interactive plots. By the way, if you're interested in interactive plotting, I will be leading an interactive plotting session sometime this year. So just keep your eyes open on the NHSR website once that's advertised. But I will be going into how you can make these interactive plots that, you know, when you hover over 
the bars, there will be more information coming up. You can like click on the legend and things to suppress certain lines. So it's really, really cool. That's kind of the next step. But yeah, that's just to kind of showcase some of the more intermediate level things that you can do. And then this is an example of another dashboard that I don't think we need to go through because I think I've already convinced you that there's a lot of things that you can do with R. And you can also connect to an SQL connection through, I think, keys or something like that. I personally haven't used R to SQL yet. Um, but if you do have an SQL database, it's definitely possible it's connected to R, although I'm not in the best position to answer questions related to this. So sorry about that, but I'm sure that there will be other people in the NHSR Slack channel that can answer your questions. If you aren't part of the NHSR Slack channel, I will be giving uh, an invite link to those who are interested. Essentially, it's just the community on Slack that you can join and you can ask questions there related to R and there will be some very helpful people to help you out there. So I can distribute that link at the end of the session if you're interested. And the NHSR community and our communities in general are very inclusive. Um, this one is on X or formerly Twitter. Uh, so just to give you that plug that we are on social media and we are inclusive of everybody, not just those who work in NHS, but people like me who work more like in the public sector, uh, Harfordshire County Council, um, you know, people from the Health Foundation as well. Um, yeah, so we're very, we're very welcoming to people. So this course, um, we really like the perspective of teaching when it comes to teaching uh, to produce a minimum viable product. So we don't want to build something, I guess, like in the first example, I feel like this infographic shows it best instead of my, um, explanation, but we want to get you started so that you have something minimally viable that is working rather than just like a piece of the puzzle at the start that you then have to build up so that you can actually get something that's useful. We want to give you something useful at the start, even though it is kind of minimalist, um, simple, basic, but it is enough to get you started so that you can get on to the next step and then build your skill level up so that you can get to more advanced things. And it's also possible that you don't really need the more advanced uh, methods to use R. You, you know, R is very useful because from uh, a beginner's point of view, you know, the data wrangling, the automation, the R markdown templates, the automated reporting, it's all very useful at the start. Um, and then you can build up, you know, to like interactive plotting, to like dashboarding, but you know, it's still, it's still useful even if you don't go through all of those advanced steps, if that makes sense. Cool, so as I said, relaxed and informal, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have any questions. All the slides and code are available on GitHub as well. So I will just pop that link in the chat just so that you have it, but all the course materials, all the slides, all the code, are available in this link if you want to kind of go back and review at your leisure. Right, so let's begin with probably one of the biggest questions uh, anyone who's first starting has. R versus R Studio, what is the difference? So R is the programming language. Uh, you might have heard of Python, SQL, JavaScript, you know, these are all programming languages. R is the same. R is a programming language. And RStudio is the software application, is the interface that you use to interact with R as a language. So if you use Python, it's basically uh, Python is the language. And I think uh, Jupyter Notebook or, yeah, I'm messing that up because I don't really use Python, but it is, you know, you will have kind of a software interface that you use to use the Python language. R Studio is the same. So R is kind of like 
you know, the engine, the backbone of the car, and our studio is everything, you know, uh, that covers it up, that makes it possible for the human in the driver's seat to uh, use that engine to get to places. That makes sense. I also don't know a lot about cars, so I'm really sorry if I'm butchering that metaphor. But yeah, hopefully that explanation makes sense. And we'll, we'll be using our studio on Positive Cloud. Um, and we'll be using uh, coding in the R. So that is the difference. Our studio has excellent features to help you with your analysis. Um, it's not really that important to think about R and R studio as separate because I don't think, well, there probably are, but it's probably rare for you to see somebody that is coding without R studio and is using R. You can use R in a terminal line, I think, because it is a coding language. Once you download the coding language, you can use it. But I think most R users just use R Studio, so you can just kind of refer to them interchangeably. Right, so whenever you open an R Studio session, you open an R session. Uh, we've already done that. If you're on Plastic Cloud, we've already done that. You've already opened an R Studio session when you cloned that link that I showed you. So you've already opened an R session, your first R session. So congratulations on that. Now the interface is quite simple once you get used to it. The console, which should be the biggest window that pops up, um, that is where you could write your code. Um, there's another place where you can write your code, which I'll cover in a second, but essentially you can code directly uh, in the R language on this console window. So if I just minimize the slides right here and just show you, your console is here and you will probably notice that you can type in uh, the lower section here. So if you just type like any mathematical equation two plus two and press enter, it will pop, uh, it will, uh, the result will pop up. Right, so yeah, anything mathematical will work, anything in the R language. So we'll cover that in a second. So hopefully that makes sense. You know, it's kind of similar to if you ever use a terminal, um, it's, it's the same logic. So that's the console. Now, the better way to code an R is to open up an R script. And you can do that. I'm just going to minimize the slides because it's better to show you uh, in R Studio. If you just click on this icon at the top left, that's a green plus sign. Just click on that and then click on R script. It will open up an additional window. And this is your script window. You can type the same things here, like 2 plus 2 and run it by clicking on control enter. And then you'll notice in the console, it will once again return the same result. So you can kind of run everything in your script window and get the result in the console. And that is how I would normally use R. I don't really type in the console that often unless it's for like a very quick check. Usually I do all my coding within the script. The reason why I would do that is because you can then save the script. So I'm just gonna save it as like, temp for now, save that, and then it'll pop up here. So every time I open the script and I run the script, I will get the same result in the console. And for stuff like plots, it will show up as well, you know, so you can imagine that that is probably the ideal way to use R because if you just type your queries into the console, uh, that's not really going to be kept, you know, you can't, I mean, you can copy and paste everything here and give it to your colleague, but that's really inconvenient. You would rather just send them this script file, you know? Cool. Uh, so in addition to running a line of code using the control enter shortcut, which is what I like to do, you can also select the script and then click on run. That will do the same thing. But I like to do the keyboard shortcut because it prevents me from reaching for my mouse every single time. So I just do the keyboard shortcut, control enter. 
I think is very fast and convenient. Um, yes, and you can also use another keyboard shortcut to create a new script. So you'll see it here, Control Alt Shift N. You can do that if you want to use your keyboard more, but I don't really open up too many R scripts, so I don't mind just clicking. Okay, um, so the slide just kind of goes through what I just said. It's called an editor as well. Right, commenting code, that's important to know. So sometimes when you're writing an R script, you don't want to run everything. You also kind of want to take notes. So for example, I might want to say, um, uh, code below calculates sum of two and two. You know, obviously this is a very simple <laughs> uh, thing to add a comment for, but if you were doing something more complex, you kind of want to write some notes so that if somebody else sees your script, they can understand what you're trying to do. So this is very helpful, especially if you're just beginning to kind of document what you're doing, because when you're learning at the start, if you go back to your previous scripts, you might want to just make sure that you know what you were doing at the time of, of that code. Um, so it is good to document, and I recommend during this class to also comment as you go, because you never know when you're going to come back to it. And also, I think commenting is just like note taking, you know, if you just comment regularly, then that will help you learn better. And anything that you uh, add a hashtag before, it will just be treated. I mean, you can already notice it's a different color. So this essentially means that if you run this code, this piece of text is going to be ignored by R, right? So if I didn't have this hashtag, if I run this, it will give me an error. Unexpected symbol in code below. It's because R is like, this doesn't look like R code. Are you sure you're doing something right? So. Whenever you're taking notes, just add a hashtag before it, and it'll be ignored when you run it. Hopefully that makes sense. And again, if you've used like Python, um, then you know they they also have a similar thing where you can just add comments that are ignored when you run the code. Cool. And you got some other things like um, options. So sometimes I think this is more relevant if you're using R locally, not when you're using Posit Cloud. But um, in tools and global options, you, I don't think you really need to do this alongside me. It's just for your information. It generally is good to untick this workspace uh, option because What's best practice is whenever you start an R session, you want every your we want your environment to be clean, and you don't want to have any leftover data from your previous session. This means is, say that today you did some coding and then you left your PC, but your R session still remembers the data sets that you had in your previous session, and you log on the next day, and then you open up your R session, and then it has the same has the same uh, data, has the same uh, variables in your environment. It sounds like this would be useful, but most of the time, the best practice is that you need to start on a clean slate because if you do some new coding in the new day, um, you don't want those leftover variables affecting your workspace because it's not going to be a reflection of reality, if that makes sense. You don't want things from your work left over from yesterday to influence your work in, at the new day, unless it's the complete same task that you're working on yesterday, I guess it's okay. But usually, you know, if you end the task on one day and then you start a new session, the new day, you, you're kind of on a new task. So you don't want to be influenced by the things that you saved the previous day. And hopefully that makes sense. Um, even if you're working on the same task, you should be able to just run the script and everything should be the same, right? If something's not the same, then you've done something wrong. 
Um, if you're still confused about that explanation, I'm happy to kind of try to explain it in a different way. But it, it is considered best practice to not have the sect, just so you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's some things that you could do to make it more accessible um, vision-wise. So again, in global options, and you can try this out, you can make the text bigger so that it's better, better for visibility, less eye strain. You can change the theme and the text. Um, so I usually like to have dark mode theme on, like Dracula or material. It's easier to me on the eyes. I'll just reduce the text size a little bit. Um, you can also change the font. There's a certain font that you prefer. So you can customize your RStudio experience to suit what you prefer. So I just change it to dark mode. I will change it back to the white theme because I think it's better for visibility in the course. So I think it was this one. Yeah. But usually I would do dark mode. So you can you can change that to whatever you prefer. Right. Um, any questions, by the way, uh, any questions so far about what I've covered? Because I know that that was quite a lot in a short span of time. Cool. I'm happy to move on. All right. Packages. Packages are really important. Packages are like apps for your phone. So... For example, right now we have some pre-installed packages already, um, but normally when you freshly installed RStudio into your local PC, you will just have the base packages. So the base packages are like when you get a new phone, you have like some functionalities, but sometimes you want some additional apps installed, like you want WhatsApp, uh, you know, you want your social media, you want um, an alarm app that you really like. You know, you want these extended capabilities. So you would install packages, which are kind of the equivalent in R. So some common R packages that you might want to install are modeling packages, visualization packages, um, data wrangling packages. We pre-installed some of these packages for you, so you don't need to install them now. But typically when you want to install a new package, you would type install.packages. And then you would input the name of your package here. And then you just run it, and then it will install that for you. So right now, I think you already have dplyr installed. So dplyr was one of the packages that we pre-installed. R Markdown as well, we pre-installed that. ggplot2, we pre-installed that. So you don't need to install all those. But if you were working on a fresh our studio that you just downloaded, then you will need to install all of those yourself. You can actually see a list of all the packages that you have if you go to, so on your on your right window, there's a packages tab. And then this is just a list of all the packages that you have. And also, you'll notice some of these are ticked. The ones that are ticked means that they've been loaded. So some of these have been, um, so some of these actually are just base R packages, but some of the installed ones, like for example, ggplot, ggplot2, that one is one that we pre-installed for you, right? And you'll notice that they're unticked because they haven't been loaded. I'll go into what that means in a second, but essentially when you install an app, using the phone analogy again, when you've installed an app on your phone, when you're not opening the app, you're not really using it, right? So R is kind of the same. When you want to use an, a package, you need to tell R that you want to use the package. So essentially when you load package, so like when you tick it, it's the same as kind of opening an app on your phone, if that makes sense. 
you'll notice that if you tick uh, one of the packages, the console will say library gargle. So library is kind of uh, library is synonymous with loading a package. And we'll do that in a second. But this is just to kind of like visualize all the packages that you have at the moment. Okay. Yeah, so this slide just kind of goes through what I just explained, but better. Um, yeah, you only need to install an app once. You don't need to install it every single time you use it. Once you've installed it, you can just choose to open it whenever you want. And opening it or loading it, as I keep saying, you do with a library command, which is what you saw on the console just now. And the reason, actually, let me just explain. The reason why you don't want to open every single package every single session is because it's going to be very time consuming to open every single pa package. And uh, if you can just use the phone analogy, if you're trying to open every single app at the same time, your phone probably does not have a lot of RAM left. So this is just to kind of reduce the memory load in R as well. So yeah, don't load every single package that you've installed. It's probably very, very bad practice for a reason. Yes, yeah, so like I said, if you're installing a package, use the install.packages command. And you can use the double quotation marks or the single quotation marks, both will work. But obviously don't mix them, don't start double quotation and then end it with a single quotation. I don't think anybody would do that anyway. Once you've downloaded a package, then you can just call it using library and then the name of your package. So we can try doing that now. Okay, let me just clear my script. Um, actually, let me just open up a new script. I'm just going to remove this temp script because I don't like scripts that are called temp. I'm just going to open up a new script. Uh, slide deck one, just so that I'm in track. So if everybody can try loading tidyverse, library tidyverse, and then running that, you should see on your console a few messages attaching core tidyverse packages and then a few conflicts. Don't worry about the conflicts. Um, it's not an error message. Essentially, rule of thumb, if it's a warning, read it. If it's an error, fix it. If it's a message, you know, you don't really need to pay too much. I mean, obviously, it's it's good to know when it gives you a message, but if it doesn't uh, cause any errors, then it's usually fine. But yeah, essentially what this is saying is that there are some pre-existing functions in the base R packages that are called filter and lag, and that once you've loaded in the tidyverse package, it has masked it. So whenever you refer to the filter and the lag functions, it's going to be using the tidyverse package equivalent of those functions, not the base R equivalent, which is from the stats package. Hopefully that makes sense. And everything else is fine. Mm -hmm. Everything else has a green tick, so it's fine. And while we're here, I also want to talk about what tidyverse is. So when you load in the tidyverse package, it's slightly different from when you load in other packages, like for example, R Markdown. If you load in R Markdown, you don't really get a very detailed message like this. What Tidyverse is trying to say is that Tidyverse is actually a collection of packages. So Tidyverse is quite unique in that way. Actually, if you go on Google and just type in Tidyverse, there's a better explanation on their website, but essentially it's a package collection for data scientists. And you can go through what packages are in this collection of packages. Um, so ggplot is one of them, dplyr is one of them, we'll be using those a lot, but also some other packages like per, uh, stringer, forecast of stringers about handling strings, per is a lot about um, kind of like, uh, how to explain it, like L apply, functional programming, which might not make sense um, at, this, at this point, but you know, there's a lot of better documentation that can explain it better than I do. Essentially, it speeds up loops a lot. So like the map functions, it 
can replace, you know, like for loops and L apply. But I won't be going to those because it's a little bit more intermediate level. But yes, just so that you know, Tidyverse is a collection of packages. It's not really one package. So it's a bit unique. So when you load in Tidyverse, you're actually loading in. Um, I'll just type them out for you. So when you radar is one of them. Plot two is one of them. So when you're loading in tidyverse, you're also loading in these three packages as well, or any of these packages that have been mentioned here. You're loading in all of these packages at once. And the proof of that is after you've ran library tidyverse, if you go into your packages tab again and you check which packages have been checked, you'll see that a lot more have been checked. Radar has been checked. Uh, per has been checked. Mm -mm -mm. GG plot two has been checked, forecast has been checked. So that kind of uh, gets the point across, I think. Cool, so that's tidyverse. And then I'll also mention um, all of the packages that you're installing most likely are from the CRAN repository. So CRAN stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. As of April, 2022, it's got almost 19,000 packages in it. They're all free to use. They're all peer reviewed. So they've all been tested um, before they've been put in the in the network. So you can be assured that they're bug free. You know, they're not in development. Um, and there's, you know, with almost 19,000 packages, you can imagine all the possibilities that you could do. You know, there's packages for interactive graphics, dashboarding, machine learning, algorithms, you know, like clustering, uh, those fancy things, PCA analysis, all those modeling um, methods, data mining, creating PowerPoint documents, mapping, everything. So there's a lot that you can do. If you actually just Google like our package for something, 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 you'll probably get some result. There are also a lot of packages that are more in their development stage that are hosted on GitHub, which is a free version control um, online repository website. So some of the packages built by N members of NHSR have been hosted there as well. So there's a different way of downloading them. You'll have to add in um, some more code like remote um, install GitHub command but you can also install packages that are in development from GitHub and our open site as well. They're peer reviewed our packages um, like fingertips R from UKHSA. You can also download uh, this package if you just follow the instructions on their GitHub page, but we won't really be going through that today. We'll just be using the tidyverse packages mainly for today. Okay, and I've already explained what Tidyverse is. Um, as I said, it collects some of the most popular R packages into one. And during this workshop, we'll be using ggplot2, dplyr, and radar. And these are all bundled up in the library Tidyverse command that we just ran. So I've already explained what this message meant. And yeah, just to reiterate, warnings, not errors. They're just for your information, right? So when you see like a warning message in your R console, don't panic. If it's not an error, errors are usually shown in red, by the way. If it's not an error, you know, don't panic. Some warning messages are also in red, but the distinction is that when it's a warning, it won't stop the operation. If it's an error, it will actually stop your operation which means that the code, the piece of code that you just ran, it has stopped it from execution. When it's a warning, it's probably all ran through, so you'll get a result, but it's just gonna pop out a warning message in addition. Okay, that's the end of the slide deck. Uh, anybody has any questions so far? Otherwise, I'll be moving on. Uh, I had a quick question. Yes, Hassan. Um, uh, thank you, um, by the way. Um, I just wanted to ask the list of packages that are already uh, just showing um, in the like, with tick boxes, are those yes. just base R packages? 
or all of the packages that are available? I would say, uh, oh, well, most of these I think are base R. Okay. Some of these are the pre-installed ones from the template. So anything that has tidy in the title, uh, in the title is probably from tidyverse. Um, okay. Also like anything here as well, dplyr, readr, uh, ggplot2, those are also the pre-installed ones are marked down as well. But the vast majority, because it's quite a long list, it's all base R. That Thank you. Come, yeah. And obviously, you can install more packages, and that will add to this list. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Uh, That's a good question. I just put in the chat a question about 32 or 64 bit, and Ruth kindly answered that. So thank you. And I have a look at that um that link that you sent. It looks looks good. Um. Mm -hmm. Is there somewhere that kind of reviews all the different possibilities of the packages that gives advice on, you know, there's so many, so it's probably a bit of a minefield trying to find the right ones that potentially you'd want to use. So is there some kind of index or review of those or direction? Yeah, so I think you might be interested in the CRAN repository. So I'm just going to send a link to that on the in the chat again, once that loads. But I would say when you're first starting off, I would use the Tidyverse collection of packages. So again, if you just Google Tidyverse, it will send you to the website where you can see the full list of Tidyverse packages. It really does cover everything you need uh, on a basic level, like plotting, data cleaning, and um, reading in data, and dealing with strings. So I think those are those will already cover a lot of what people need. But if you want more, I would go, sorry, just trying to find the slide deck. I would go on the crown repository and you can have a look there. Or honestly, just like Google it because that's what I do. So I'm just going to yeah, send, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to send this link. I found some quite good stuff on YouTube of um, various people just kind of talking through their experience and obviously some starting at quite basic level and some more advanced. So yeah. Some really helpful stuff out there. Yeah. And also I'm going to mention this, but just to let you know that there are help pages about each package and what each function does. So if you're ever unsure of what a function does in your console, I'm just gonna here, if you add a question mark and then the name of the function. So for example, there is a function called select. And if you're ever curious about how to exactly use this function, if you just type in uh, the question mark followed by the name of the function, select, there will be a page that pops up that will tell you all about it. And then at the end, which I find most useful, they will have examples of how you can use it. So some example code that will get you started. And also every package should have a help page um, so, for example, Tidyverse has a whole website for it, but for other packages, like, for example, there's a package that I use called Plotly for interactive plotting. Um, I would just Google that. It will take me to the official help page for it, and then it will just show me all the possible charts that I can make with it, and then example code of how you can use it. So every package, well, any package that has been published on CRAN and has been rigorously tested to be published on CRAN should have its own page like this. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I just had a more general question. Um, yeah. When do you expect that we'll have breaks today? Um, so I think we can go for a break in around 30 minutes. I just have one slide deck to go through and I can go for 10 minute break before resuming until 1230. And so 1230, are we having half an hour? Uh, I think 1230 is the end of the session, isn't it, Ruth? Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. so you can have a break at 11 and then carry on for an hour and a half, and then that's the end of the session. Right, okay, cool, thank you. No problem. Any other questions?
Mm, no, okay, you can carry on to the next slide, which is more quick and easy. So our studio projects, this one's gonna be very quick. Um, I'll explain why in a sec. So um, if you're on Posit Cloud, you've already opened a project. Um, so I'm just gonna backtrack a little, you don't need to do this, but I'll just back out for a bit. When you clicked and cloned Zoe's project, you've already made your own project because Zoe has made a template project, a template R Studio project for you that you are able to clone in your own. So you've already opened your own R Studio project. Um, R Studio projects are different from opening a session. When you're opening a session, it just means that you've opened up R Studio, like you started up. When you open an R Studio project, um, so actually I can demonstrate this, but there's a button here called new project, new R Studio project. When you click on that, you open up a new project. Everything is self-contained in your R Studio project. So I will, let me show you what I mean. Right, so in your console window, again, you will see that there is kind of a path here. There's a slash cloud slash project, and there's also a button that lets you kind of refresh your path so that if you're ever outside of your project, you just click on this link, you'll come back into your project. Every R Studio project should be independent of whatever is outside of it. So all the data, all the files, all the outputs you need for this project that you're working on, say it's like a report or a plot or a dashboard project that you started, everything that you need for that dashboard should be inside this project folder. That makes sense. It's kind of like when you're, even if you're not using R, you know, if you just normally start a work project, you will have a designated folder for it, right? And you'll name that folder something like dashboard version two or something like that. And all the data, well, if you're organized, all the data that you need for that dashboard are going to be in that folder. So it's the same logic. In an R Studio project, you're not going to be reading in data that is outside of your R Studio project. Um, and in case you're ever doubtful if you're inside an R Studio project, you can always check. Um, actually, this is a bit awkward on Posit Cloud. That's actually not the indicator there. Um, okay, but if you're maybe the slide can help me out. Yeah. So where is it? Okay, well, if you're in local R at the top, uh, on the top right, it will say the name of your project. Because you're in Posit Cloud, um, it's essentially the name is up here. So you'll know that you're inside a project called Intro RR Studio. And your project folder will just contain everything that you need for your project. Nothing, like no data should be outside of it. And you should not rely on any scripts or anything else from outside of this folder. Yeah, so your working directory path should just, everything should refer inside of the of the folder in your R, R Studio project folder. You'll see what I mean in a second when we try to import data. Okay, yeah, and I've already said, if you click on this little tiny arrow near this path, you'll just be taken back into your project folder. So if you ever kind of stray outside of it by accident or on purpose, if you're exploring, just click on this and then you'll be back to where you should be in your working directory. Um, yes, don't need to go through that. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. So in terms of like if your team has like shared mapping tables and stuff, would yeah. best practice to then be have separate versions of those inside the project? Um, that's a good question. If it's a shared, if it's a shared data set, I would advise that you guys all have, um, this is kind of going to like, have you heard of Git? 
Yeah. Yeah. So I would say that you should put your uh, data uh, in some form of version control and then push it using Git, considering if mm -hmm. it's like confidential, then obviously you'll need kind of a private Git server. But something like that would be ideal. If you if your team can't use Git, then I would advise that you just all import that data set into your R Studio projects because um, I don't think the way R works is you shouldn't be taking data from outside of your R Studio project. So shared documents like that, you'll all have to kind of import it from your shared folder into R. Mm -hmm. But obviously, ideally, you should be using Git or some kind of privatized uh, version of Git so that you can push and pull data sets like that. Brilliant. Thank you. No problem. It's a good question. OK, so this will encourage you to be more organized um, because everything you need is in your project folder. So you don't need to go around looking for files um, vital for your project. Everything should be in the same space and you'll know exactly where everything is stored. Obviously, if you're sharing this project with other people, then um, when you're kind of sharing the folder, you'll be sharing the data set with them. Or as I mentioned previously, it'll be ideal if you had some kind of version control software set up like Git so that everybody can kind of push and pull, these are Git terms, but push and pull the same, uh, the same data into their uh, local repositories. But I think Git needs a different workshop on its own. So again, look out for if NHSR does a session on Git, but it is a very, very useful tool. If you're ever curious about it, you can send me a message on Slack or email me and I'll be happy to give you some resources related to that. It's also free to download. The only thing is IT might not let you download it if you're working in the public sector, <laughs> from my experience. Um, so yeah, just, just so that you have that information. Um, is there any? But, yeah. That'd be really helpful to have a look at that. Is there any particular reason it doesn't get downloaded? Is that because it's not like some verified or Microsoft Office kind of version? Yeah, it's not it's not verified, but I imagine that you might go through the same issues when you're downloading our studio. Because um, usually, you know, software like that uh, might not be verified by IT and they might have to, you know, investigate whether they're safe to download um, and safe to use. Uh, in terms of Git, it's a little bit more complicated because Git needs to send information back and forth to the web. Um, because what, how Git works is it will store your project information. Um, it will take snapshots of it. So that's how the version control works is it will kind of take a snapshot of how your current project looks like, and then you'll be able to share that with other people. Um, you know, that's kind of what makes it so easy for collaboration using Git. But obviously to do that, you do need to share information to the web and then your colleagues will then need to access that information from the web using Git so that they can get it into their local PC as well. Um, because of the nature of that, you know, IT might need to investigate a little bit further about what, whether it's safe or not. Um, so yeah, it, it, it might get complicated because of that. If that does that make sense? Yeah, no, question? yeah. Yeah, there's so much more stricter these days, aren't they, with um, organizations like that, but yeah. okay, thanks. Yeah. But I personally, our team has personally been able to uh, not use Git and still collaborate quite well using using R. What we do it is like, you know, we could store our R folders onto our shared drive. And then uh, people can just kind of open those folders and open their own R sessions. And because, you know, we all have the same shared drive, the data set should, if the data set is stored there, then we can also access those those data sets yeah and some of those things are the most critical to sort out at the start isn't it because if you yeah. if you can't share it and you can't host it or access it then it's kind of futile right yeah i mean i would if you're in a shared organization you can't use git i would put all of your uh our projects into one folder where it's clear where this folder 
contains all the R projects and then everybody can just open them as they work on them. You will have to be more communicative about uh, when you've updated project or not because you will need to let each other know like, oh, I've updated the data for, for this. So when you open it up, you'll expect this change and what. So you might, for like really big changes, you might want to communicate that. But otherwise, you know, we've, at the earlier stages, we were working like that and it was fine. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yes, so it makes it far easier for you to organize your files, workflow, you can switch between projects as well. So when you get out of an RStudio project and get into a new one, it's very clear that you're in a new one because all the project files are going to be different, right? Um, so, you know, it makes a very good distinction between what you're, what you're working on. Uh, and obviously it makes it very easy to share your scripts and projects with others. All you need to do is kind of share the RStudio project folder with your colleague or save it into a share drive, as I just said, and they will be able to access all the data sets and all the, uh, all the outputs that you worked on in that project. I take it it's quite good for kind of from one project copying code and then pasting it into a new project to kind of reuse and recycle, right? So you don't have to recode stuff all the time, it, you know, just yeah. take a section of it and then kind of customize it for a new project. Yeah, that's another that's another big bonus with using yeah. R. Because like, in my experience, when we were working with COVID, we had like the same script to clean the COVID data sets, but obviously we had to use the COVID data sets for different purposes. Um, so yeah, you could just copy and paste like, a script that you use to clean the data set, but then the rest of the code can be dedicated to, you know, a different model or a different methodology or a different visualization. Yeah, and on that note, do people share some examples of what they've done for particular different projects that they've worked on? Is, is that on GitHub or something like that? Yes, yes, that would, that would be on GitHub. Obviously, if it's confidential information, you can't share it on GitHub because it's completely public. But if it's been properly anonymized and or if it's using public data that you can freely share, then, you know, people would put it on GitHub. Our team has had some public projects on GitHub as well. So I can just quickly share one of our dashboard codes. Um, I'm not sure how interesting it would be, but we do like go into explaining what it is. This is a shiny dashboard, by the way. So another good example, of like what art can do. So that link will take you to all the code that creates this dashboard that will load in a second. Yeah. So that code generates all of this. And you can kind of freely download that code and then run it in your own local R Studio or on Posit Cloud. Yeah, I think that's super helpful, isn't it? Because there's no use mm -hmm. reinventing the wheel all the time. If you can borrow from others and what they've done, then it can kind of help you get ahead a bit quicker. Yeah, there's actually so much um, useful scripts in, in GitHub that's just publicly shared. Um, you know, everything is open source. All the packages, people are developing new packages, like NHSR has their own packages for, and um, UKHSA has their own packages for, uh, you know, their methods of generating confidence intervals, for example, and, you know, visualizations like tar and rugs. So all that is free to access. Um, you can use all that code, you can download those packages. Um, a lot of people will post the code they have made for automated reporting dashboards. Um, a lot of that code is actually shared in the NHSR conferences, if you've ever attended those. And also probably a lot of it is on the NHSR Slack as well. So you'll get a lot of cool resources if you join that. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, it's very exciting. Perfect, thanks. No problem. Very good question. Uh, I get to plug <laughs> the uh, public resources. Um, 
so yeah, when you're in your local R studio, this is how you would make a new project. When you're on Posit Cloud, you kind of just back out and click on a button. But if you're in your local R, let me see if I can roughly show you how it is in local R. You would go to file and then there would be an option here that doesn't exist, but there would be an option here for new project. Um, and then uh, it will ask you for like the name of the project and then you'll create one and it'll just open up with something that you see now. So it's not, it's not too different. And I trust that you can do it in your own time. Uh, yes, now your working directory is your project directory and R will save and load files here from default. Now that is the most important thing, right? Whenever you're making a new script or whenever you're uploading a data set to your R Studio project, it will always be in that folder. It will never land outside of it or somewhere else. And you can also switch between projects. So again, this is something that I can't really demonstrate on Posit Cloud. But if you're in local R Studio, at the top right corner, you'll see like this blue R icon. And then if you click on it, there'll be an option for you to either open up a new project or open a different project. So that's just for you to know, so you don't need to try that right now because we don't need to open a new project for this workshop. Okay, that's the end of that slide deck. Any questions before I move on to importing data and get started on some data wrangling? Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on. Let's actually start some coding. All right, so first we need to mention that there are packages to import all types of data. There are packages for importing CSV files, my favorite CSV files, they're the simplest to work with, and Excel workbooks. So there's a package specifically for Excel workbooks. Um, I think there are base R defaults as well, but there are also some packages where it will import the data in a more clean way. I'll tell you what that looks like in a second. So for now, for this uh, workshop, let's get started. We would like to import the capacity underscore AI CSV file. So the slide kind of goes into how you would import it using the wizard. So I'm just going to show you that first because it's my least preferred way to do it. And then we'll end it with my most preferred way to do it, which is actually putting it in the script. So if you'd like to follow along, uh, find the capacity underscore AE CSV file in your R project folder. And then click on import data set. Once you've done that, this pop-up window should appear. And then it will give you a preview of the data set. Uh, so it's got five columns and it's got a preview of the first 50 rows. It's got the name here. So if you want to edit the name beforehand, you can do so now. You can also do some stuff like skipping the first row. So sometimes when you're importing an Excel file, the first row would be like mm -hmm. a title or a description. So if that that is what is going on in your data set, then you can choose to skip the first two rows or something here. But in this case, the CSV file is quite clean, so we don't need to skip anything. Um, there are some pre-ticked options, like using the first row as names. We do want that. Trim spaces. Uh, yeah. Trim spaces, open data viewer. It's already open, so we don't need to worry about that. Delimiter is the comma, so if you know CSV files, you know that they're separated by commas, so obviously we want that. And then it gives you a very neat code preview of what you're actually doing when you're doing everything. So for example, if I edit the skip to, the code preview will update as well. So the code updates itself to skip equals two and then viewing it. So the viewing is what gives you this preview, right? I'm just gonna reset everything back to zero. So this code is what I would prefer us to do instead of using this window, because as you can see, everything that you're editing in this interface is 
getting translated into the code. It should actually, it's the other way around. Everything that is the code is being uh, portrayed in the UI. So I think this is very useful if you're just starting and you want a quick preview of your data set. Um, sometimes I use it just as a preview for the data set, but it is ideal to just put it into the code, right? So I'm just gonna click import just to show you that it works. Obviously it will work. Uh, once you click import, you will see the data set in your environment. So your environment is the window on the top right uh, tab. Once you've imported the data set, you will see that there's a new entry called capacity underscore AE. It says it's got 68 observations, meaning 68 rows, five variables, meaning five columns. And if you click on that, uh, it will pop up in a viewer where you can look at your data set and you can close that viewer, click on it to reopen it. All that makes sense, I think. If you want, so I know that in the earlier stages of analysis, you do want to explore your data set. You will probably also want to kind of sort things or like look at particular categories in a column. So sorting is really easy. If you've got a numerical va uh, variable, just click on a column and then it will sort itself either in ascending or descending order. You can do this for strings as well. Um, or in the case, this is a logical, but strings basically by alphabetical order, you can also sort it and click on it. Uh, if you click on this little filter icon at this position here, you'll be able to kind of filter to specific numerical ranges. Like for example, I want to filter just in the 11, sorry, 110,000 range ish then you can do that. You can also sort by logical. So if you want only the trues, you can do that. Um, yeah, and then to unfilter, just click on the filter button and it'll reset all the filters that you just done. So it's kind of like Excel in that way, which is quite nice. Let's you uh, get the data exploration in before you do any analysis. Uh, once you're done kind of looking through your data set, obviously then you can start doing some actual uh, data wrangling operations. Before we do that, though, I would like to again uh, reiterate that this is not the ideal way to import data. Um, I'll explain why, OK? So when you're importing data using the, the, the clicking approach using this UI, you're not keeping the code of you importing that data. So what will happen is every time you're importing a data set, if you're sharing it to a colleague, your colleague is going to be like, I ran the script. Why am I not? Why am I getting errors? It's because you need to then tell your colleague, oh, well, you need to import this data set first, and then you have to run the script. Whereas it'd be much simpler if you just copied this piece of code, cancel it, and then paste it here. And then when you run everything, you will get the data set in. So I'm just going to clean my environment. By the way, this is also useful for you to know. If you want to clean your environment so that you can have a clean slate just to test that your script works well from scratch, there is a broom icon at the top here that will clean your environment, including hidden objects. I would advise you to not untick this. And then your environment is empty. And then you can run everything in your script from the top and then just make sure that it all works. And this is the same data set. So I would much rather prefer um, people do it this way because that ensures that your script is self-dependent. You know, you don't need to depend on any, any manual operations like clicking on the data set and then importing it. Even, especially if you're editing stuff here, like changing the name or skipping the rows or anything else, like you really don't want to do all that stuff manually when you're working in R. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's get back to the slide. So yeah, hopefully you've all at this point read in the data using the read underscore CSV function. The read underscore CSV function, by the way, uh, is from the read R package. So if you were to, sorry, let me clear my environment again, just to prove a point. If you were to not 
library and the reader package, and then you try to run this. Oh, I think it's because I have tidyverse. That should not be working. Uh, that should not be working. Well, it's nice that it is working, even though I'm, I'm expecting a bug, <laughs> which is usually the opposite of what happens. But usually, if you were to do this, um, this will create an error. Uh, the reason being is that you want to at least library in tidyverse or library in the reader package, which is part of tidyverse, before you can use this function, because this function is not a base R function. So just to forewarn you, I think the base R function equivalent is read.csv. So it's very similar. It's just that it's a dot instead of an underscore. So you'll be able to run this and it'll be the same. It's just, it's a little bit less clean in certain cases. It, the, the data set is very clean right now that we're using. So you're not seeing any difference, but you might see a difference if you were to use uh, a messier data set. So just so you know that read underscore CSV is different from read dot CSV. There's a bit of a distinction. And also I think read underscore CSV will turn your data set into a tibble instead of a data frame. Let me just double check that. Um, class capacity. Reread it. Just double check that it's the same. Yeah. So you don't you don't need to do this, and it really doesn't matter when you're at the beginning stage of using R, but tibble is different from data frame. Tibble is like a more clean version of a data frame, but they work essentially the same way. So you don't need to worry about the distinction at the moment. It's just that one is a bit cleaner and easier to work with uh, with tidyverse packages. Okay. When you press the broom button to clear yes. the environment, does that stop the packages that you've loaded? Does that clear them as well? That's a great question. And typically, yes, okay. but I'm not sure why it's not doing that now, because when I clear it and run this, it still works. So maybe it's something specific to posit cloud. But typically, if you're using uh, R locally, when you clean your environment, it should clean the loaded packages as well. Actually, let me just check because it actually I, it, for me it doesn't tend to get rid of packages it might be a version of our thing oh really i tend to Maybe... if i want to empty things i tend to have to run like restart r so you go session restart r, and that's how i would like check myself that all the packages have gone okay, okay. I don't, yeah it's possible that different versions of r do different things yes definitely okay well that that is good to know um so yeah, it may or may not, depending on the version that you got installed. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, yes, very good question. Okay, yeah, so, right. You can also import data set from here. Uh, where is that? Oh yeah, so you can also import a data set from here using either base R or read R. As I said, there's a distinction. And then here you kind of have to manually type in the name of it. And I don't really use this option that much. Oh, click on the update and then you'll see it. Yeah, so you can, you can also do this. But in my opinion, if you have to use the wizard or the UI, I would, I would just click on it and then click on import data set. But yeah, you can also import it from, from here if you wish. Cool, so that's all the ways. Yes, and the slides agree with me that importing it this way is not what we want. Instead, we like to copy the line of code into the editor and then include it as part of your script. Oh, one thing that I want to point out, okay, in case you're curious, there is this code here called view capacity AE. We don't really need to put that in the script, but just so that you know what it does, if you do capacity AE, if you run that, it will 
open up this viewer window for you. So the viewer command just opens that up essentially. You don't really want to include that as part of your script though, because you don't want, when somebody else is running the script or when you're running the script in the future, you don't want your operation interrupted by a sudden uh, tab change, you know? So I, if I want to view it, usually what I would do is I would include it in the console because usually it's for like a quick look anyway. So I would just type view capacity AE if I'm too lazy to, if I'm too lazy to click on this here, then I'll just type in view capacity in the console and it'll do the, the pop-up thing for, for me. But typically don't include the views in your script because that will interrupt your operation. Uh, just gonna save this, I don't lose it. So um, yeah, I would also advise you to kind of save your script. Uh, saving is easy, either you do control S as a shortcut or you click on this floppy disk icon and then you just name it something and then it'll get saved into your working directory. So just save that now so that you don't lose your script in case your PC crashes or anything, you haven't lost your work, right? Cool, I think I'm almost done with the slide deck. Yeah, and the slide also agrees with me that you should only copy that one line of code and not the view. Um, then it kind of goes into how you run the script and then it's the end of the slide deck, right? Yeah, so just to reiterate, you can either run your script by selecting everything that you want to run and then clicking on the run button or much faster, control S is what I prefer. But you can use whatever is more comfortable for you. And that's the end of the slide deck and I think we got five minutes for questions and then we go into the first break of the day. Uh, yeah, so any questions before we go into the break? Nope, all right. Uh, I had a quick question, sorry, sorry about okay. that. Um, just generally speaking, whenever we try to read or save documents, um, do we have to do anything like designate the working directory or is it already pre-designated um, or like, is it like where we want to like call the file from? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so yeah, as I said, because our project, uh, our projects are all independent from each other, if you're just saving the data set to the folder like this, all you need to do is input the, the name of the, fol uh, of the file. If you've got like a designated, so I'm just going to do this. You don't need to follow along, but if you've got a designated data folder in your folder, and then I move the capacity AE in there, I'm just going to move that in there, right? So let's say, okay, I'm going to ignore everything. But for example, if you're a very organized person and in your R project folder, you want all the data sets in one folder, all the outputs in another folder, all the documentation in another folder, you can do it that way. And then the way you read in the data is data slash capacity AE. So if I clear everything and this will error, it says it does not exist in the current working directory. So because I moved it into the data folder, then you specify data slash capacity underscore AE, and then it will read it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So like, yeah. Start from whatever the folder. If it's if it's in the working directory, then we don't need to define it further than the file name. But if it's within a folder, exactly. we, okay. And yeah. if you had a different folder that wasn't a working directory, would we have to basically just go up a layer kind of thing? Or... Yes. Okay. So I'm just gonna try this real quick. I don't know if I've got perms, but if I move this beds data outside into the cloud folder, which is Oh, permission denied. Okay, I can't do that. But if it was in a folder outside of your folder, you will need to do the dot dot um, dot dot slash. Okay. Yeah. Got you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, yes. So obviously, 
best practice is to never have to use a dot dot because you want everything that you need in your project folder. But if there's a specific, um, as if there's a specific case that you do need to do that, then the dot dot. And obviously, if it's another folder outside of it, then it's dot dot slash dot dot slash. Yeah. Cool. I'm just gonna move this back. And we can go on a 10 minute break if there are no other questions. Cool, so I'm just going to stop sharing. Uh, right, let's go for a break and come back at 10 past. That sounds good to everyone. I'm going to put it in the chat. Zoom at. All right, see you guys in 10 minutes. Great, thank you.
Hello, everyone. Can you just uh, raise your hand or react if you are back? Okay. Seeing a few. Great. All right. I think we can make a start soon. All right, I'll reshare my screen. Um, also, my mic has been having very weird issues lately. So if my audio is suddenly weird, please let me know in the in the chat or speak up. But if it's fine, then I think I will just keep going. All right. Okay, let me just make sure that's, yeah, okay. All right, so hopefully people had a nice break, got some tea or a snack or anything uh, else that you needed because um, it is a lot of information to take in on a Wednesday morning. I'm completely aware. So, right. After we've imported that data set, we are going to do some more fun stuff with it. We are going to create some plots using gplot2. And then I think after we finish the plotting exercise, um, That'll be the end of the session, essentially. I think there'll be a, a few extra things that I'll go through, but it's very quick. And then we can just resume the data wrangling and our markdown part of the workshop next week. So this week, I think mainly to introduce you to R, how to import data, and how to create some simple visuals using your data set. And then next week, we'll go into more data cleaning, uh, joining data sets, and how to create a an automated report, the ones that I've been referring to for a while. Okay, so, oh, and also I forgot to mention, but these slide decks are available on this website. I forgot to send you guys the link, but if it helps, you can follow along the slides here and uh, you can look through them after the session is over. So you can kind of navigate through each section on the table of contents on the left here. So I'm just going to start the introduction to ggplot bit. Also just, you know, I am sharing my screen, so you don't really need to open up a separate window. It's just to let you know that the slides are available here and they're created by Zoe. All right, so Zoe here acknowledges that this section kind of shadows chapter three of this book by, um, about what his name is, but it's quite a popular book for uh, using R for data science. And I think it's also free to read online. Like the entire book is has been translated into this online website. So again, I will share the link. Pratt, if you want to go through that in your own time, it's a very comprehensive book, it goes through data visualization, as well as, you know, the date, the data wrangling stuff that we'll be going through next week as well. So after this week and next week, if you ever want a refresher, feel free to refer to this book, because it's very useful. And then um, it will also go into a little bit more intermediate level are things like how to create a function, how to go through some for loops, if else statements, more R markdown stuff. Um, yeah, more intermediate stuff. So feel free to look through that at your leisure. Okay. So ggplot2 is possibly the most popular package for creating data visuals, plotting, etc. for our users. 
Um, as you can see in this uh, previously Twitter poll here, most people use ggplot or only ggplot instead of using the base R plots. I've actually only used the base R plotting functions while I was first introduced to R in uni, but they aren't very nice. I mean, they're good. You can make them really pretty, but I feel like the syntax is a bit confusing, especially if you're starting off in R, whereas ggplot2 really makes it simplified and you can get to a very nice plot very quickly using ggplot2, in my opinion. Uh, Plotly is also mentioned here. I think I briefly mentioned Plotly in the first half of today's session. Plotly is essentially for interactive plots only. And again, quick plug for my interactive plotting course that will also go on sometime this year. I think possibly April-ish is when I suggested it to be. But essentially, um, in that workshop or uh, training session, I'm going to be going through the interactive plotting packages like Plotly instead of just static plots like ggplot2. So what I mean by static is ggplot2 creates images like PNG plots, the ones that you can easily put into like a Word document or a PDF or any other report. It's just an image. Whereas Plotly is used as a widget. So a widget is has interactive elements. You can hover over things and see pop-ups appear. Uh, you can click on things. You can interact with it. There are like little buttons sometimes that appear on the side corner. You can add buttons. You can add that extra level of interactivity to your plots with packages like Plotly. So in case you're curious, that's what Plotly is. But we won't be using Plotly today. We'll be using ggplot2 because ggplot2 is very, very much a foundation for our users. Um, and you can create some very, very nice visuals using ggplot2. It's well designed and supported, highly versatile, and looks good. So this is an example of the plots that you can make using ggplot. This one is kind of a tutorial on how to create BBC style graphics in particular, which are known for these kind of minimalist, very clean and pleasing to the eye uh, data visuals. You know, they got a certain palette, they got a certain font, minima minimalist design. Um, so this is kind of just a showcase that even if the plots today we are making are not going to look exactly like this, it's possible to make your plots look like this by adjusting the options and the arguments within the ggplot2 functions. Right, so you don't really need to load anything in if you've already loaded in Tidyverse because ggplot2, as mentioned before, is part of the Tidyverse package family. And we'll start by doing uh, a perennial challenge for the NHS. So we are going to be answering a couple of research questions. So the data set that we loaded in, the capacity underscore AE data set, is around pressures in the a and &E, demand versus capacity. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. Um, it's quite an important indicator slash KPI for a lot of people to surveil, to um, keep track of or analyze. So it shows the changes in the capacity of a and &E departments from the years 2017 to 2018. It's a very clean data set, so we won't have to go into a lot of cleaning yet. We can go straight into plotting. But you can imagine that in real life, outside of this kind of workshop bubble, you probably need to do some data cleaning first. And we'll go through that next week, but just so that we can go straight into the plotting, uh, we've been provided with a clean data set for today. So the object that we just loaded in before the break, click capacity underscore AE, is a data frame. If you're ever curious about the class or the type of object that you have loaded in, you can use the class function to check. So class capacity underscore AE will show you that it is these things. It is a specific table data frame table data frame is a tibble 
and it's a data frame. So data frame is kind of the base R object name for this. Tibble is kind of a unique tidyverse thing. As I mentioned before, it is essentially the same as a data frame, but just slightly cleaner. Um, and I didn't really dive into the specifics of the differences. So I might not know as much about this as some other people who know more about tidyverse. But even in the years of work that I've had with R, it's never been an issue for me using tibbles versus data frames. Um, so I would just not worry about the differences too much at this stage. Right. You might also be curious about the other classes that are available. There are also objects, so uh, objects that can be split into strings, numerics, or logicals. We can go through that in a second when we kind of dig deeper into the code. But obviously, I'm here to tell you that data.frame is not the only class that we'll be working with today. So you can look forward to that. There are also lists that are a little bit trickier to uh, work with. I, I think, again, working if you work with lists a lot, then you are probably at a more intermediate level um, because lists can contain both data frames and vectors. So they're a completely different thing. But I think like if you were to categorize, like the main three categories, I would say there are vectors, which is like, for example, just a string of mm -hmm. objects. So if you combine vectors together, it would be a matrix, and then you can get into a data dot frame, and then you can get into a list. And lists will contain data frames, matrices, and vectors. So a data frame, by the simplest of terms, I think you can say it's kind of a collection of vectors. So each column is a vector, you know, one dimension. And a data frame is two dimensions. You've got both rows and columns. And then lists has everything. So it can have uh, it can have several data frames within it. It can have several vectors within it. It can have vectors and data frames and matrices within it. So hopefully if you are ever, if you ever see terms like lists, matrices, blah, 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 then that's what it's referring to. But again, this is kind of additional information for you in case you're curious about it. Okay, so this kind of goes into what a data frame is. It stores tabular data. So we are probably all familiar with the structure of the table shown here. Each column is called a variable in R. So you'll notice that when you have it in your environment, it says observations and variables. Variables being the columns and observations being the rows. Each variable is a, yeah, so I just said that. And each cell is a single measurement. So anybody who's opened an Excel table is very familiar with this structure. Tibble equals data frame. You might see the term tibble. We've seen it. Let's just assume them to be synonymous for now. Um, and here they go into a bit more explanation than I did. Tibbles are data frames that are lazy and surly. They do less. So they don't change very many answer types and don't approach. OK. so I. One thing that I can demonstrate this, well, I can't really demonstrate this now because all the data sets are too clean. But if, for example, um, you don't use read R to read it in <clears throat> because read underscore CSV will transform your data set into a tibble. If you did not use read dot CSV and you use read dot CSV, you won't see any changes at the moment, to be honest, because as I said, the data sets are too clean. But you might see some weird, like, name changes when you import, like the column names might be weird, especially if you have like special characters in your column names. Like maybe you've got like a dollar sign or you've got like a um, apostrophe in your column name. Those will kind of be turned into, um, I think dot is the default, but I'm sure Ruth can correct me um, if I'm wrong about that. I think read underscore uh, dot CSV will kind of keep the uh, original name of the column as much as possible. So that is one difference that you might notice if you're working with um, messier data. Yeah, so the variable names is one thing that you might notice. And they also complain less. 
So when you're importing a uh, data frame, it, it might give you warnings or an error, if a variable does not exist. Uh, when you're using read underscore CSV, transforming into a tibble, it will, oh, sorry, it's the exact opposite. It will complain more. So it will actually tell you when a variable does not exist. So that will enable you to fix those issues early rather than letting it kind of go on and then stumbling into an issue as you're doing the data cleaning step. So I think the takeaway here is Tibble is generally better. So do try to use read R equivalents of the import functions when you can. So read underscore CSV instead of read dot CSV. But if your data is already very clean, it might not be as much of an issue. And here it goes into uh, how it looks in the environment, which we've already seen. And then into how you can open the data set and view it. You can also view this data set in a separate window. If you click on that, sorry, that was too quick. I'm gonna do it again. If you click on this button here, it will open your data set into its own new window. If you have like a second monitor or something, you might find it useful to have your data set on another view and do your coding in your uh, dominant monitor or something of the sort. So you can do that as well if you want to. Right, okay, so you can view the data set like that or you can view the data set in your console. So how you would do that, one way is to do it in the script itself, which I don't really like to do because it's kind of needless code. But if you run that, you'll see that the data set is printed in your console. It is printed uh, a kind of summary view of your data set. Obviously, this is not the full 68 rows of the data set. It's only printed the first 10. So this is kind of a tibble default as well. I think if it was not a tibble, let me test this, it might look different. So if it was not a tibble, I've just done that just to show you how messier it is. So this is the view when you printed a tibble, right? It subsets it to the first 10 rows. It gives you more information. It tells you how many rows are left. When you do it with the base R, it just prints the entire thing. And you obviously will need to kind of scroll around to find what you look for. There's less information. There's less sum summarization. So again, that's another good thing about tibbles and using tidyverse is that you get these little things that just makes it feel cleaner. OK, I'm just going to change it back. Tibble view. Yeah, this is one way to do it, or you can just directly type in the console, which is what I would prefer to do if I want a quick summary view. Because if you leave this in the script, it's kind of useless in a way. Like when you're running a script in the future, you don't really care about exploring the data set. You kind of just want to get an operation going. So I usually wouldn't say this in the script, but Obviously, as a temporary kind of view, you can have a look. OK, and this is just to further reiterate that the console is very much the place to look to when you want to see a result. And I think when you're doing plots, the result will be shown on the right hand side. Again, it will be under the plots tab, but it will automatically do that. You'll see in a second. But typically with like standard outputs, it would be in the console. When it comes to plots and visuals, it'll be in the plot section. I think some tables also will show up in, in this window as well. And obviously with like reporting, it will be saved as its own file in your project folder. Hey, okay. we understand the variable names. Um, so obviously when you're exploring a data set, it's very important that you understand what each column refers to. So just for this data set, site is kind of the ID equivalent. Uh, staff increase is whether there's been an increase in staff numbers between the two years. 
And then D cubicles and D weight is the difference in the average between the two years. So uh, the difference in the cubicle uh, number, the amount of cubicles, and the difference in the waiting times. I am not sure whether it's by hours. I assume it's by hours. But, you know, not really important as it's an exercise and not real life analysis. And this is just a nice quote to get us started. The simple graph has brought more information to the data analyst mind than any other device. It's just so much easier for people to understand information when it's presented in a plot rather than described in text. I'm sure all of you would agree with that. Right, so let's get started in our first kind of uh, research question. Is a change in the number of cubicles available in A&E associated with a change in length of attendance? So when presented with kind of a question like this, I would think probably a scatter plot or a line graph would be good to kind of visualize uh, the change in, or association between two variables. So we can get started on making, I think, the scatter plot that we're starting off with. I mean, we'll find out soon. So the starting codes begin with, um, and make sure that you've loaded in Tidyverse beforehand. Starting code is always this function called ggplot. This is how, if you hover over, actually, it will tell you this function is for the purpose of creating a new ggplot project uh, object. It initializes a ggplot object, and then there are some further arguments within it. So then you open up brackets, so then you can specify some arguments within it. Usually the first argument is going to be the data set that you're using, which makes a lot of sense. So here I would say capacity AE. And then if you wanna add additional arguments, you just add a comma. And then I'm jumping the gun here, but essentially you're gonna call a, a helper function called AES. And then within AES, you're going to type in X equals something and then Y equals something. But don't run that yet because I'm just kind of filling out the blanks um, for now. But yeah, ggplot, and then uh, you would have this plus sign. I'll explain what that means in a second. As I said, the first argument would be data. So data equals capacity AE. Let me make the code cleaner. So I'm gonna remove the AES for now because again, I said I jumped the gun. It will be data equals capacity AE. If you run this, so if you do either the control enter or if you just click run while you're on the line. You'll notice that your plot window on the right kind of initiates itself, um, but it won't show anything because you haven't really told ggplot what you wanted to do with this data. All, all you've done is say, I want to use this data, but I haven't really specified how. So it will just come up with like a gray background for now. Next, we can add layers to the plus sign that I mentioned afterwards. So this line of code here, geom point, tells you that, yes, we are indeed doing a scatter plot. Um, geom point is for doing scatter plots. So points being, you know, the individual points in a scatter plot. And then you have this AES call, which you can use to specify the X and the Y axis. Let me just uh, make sure that, yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna go into some explanations now because it's quite, mm -hmm. I think it's quite intuitive. So the first argument, as I said, would be data. And then you want to add in an additional layer. And what I mean by layering is you will have a first layer where it's kind of like the foundation of the plot. The foundation of the plot will just have all the kind of meta information in it. So like, yes, I we are using this data set. And then on top of it, you're gonna say, I want scatter geometries on top. And then at the very top, you can then add some additional stuff like, oh, I want to add in a regression line or, um, oh, I want to kind of modify like the legend and stuff like that. So it's kind of like layering details on top of details. So our second layer is going to be geom underscore point geom underscore point is another function in the ggplot2 package. Open up a bracket to specify more arguments or details in it. 
And then within it, we've got a helper function called AES, which stands for aesthetic. And then within the aesthetic, mm -hmm. you're going to mention that the X axis is going to be D cubicles, I think. Let me just double check. Yes, D cubicles. And then comma, uh, Y axis equals uh, the average waiting time difference. So a couple of things to point out whenever you're specifying different arguments, what I mean by arguments is data is an argument, X is an argument, Y is an argument. Arguments essentially are parts of the function where you can actually specify uh, elements of it. So for example, geom point is going to be useless unless you kind of specify what the X axis and what the Y axis variables are going to be. To specify those, you need to use the arguments to kind of input what you want uh, the, the function to do. There's probably more uh, techie ways of saying that, but I've decided to just kind of freestyle it, as you can see. And then arguments are separated by commas. So anytime that you want to specify an addition argument, like there's also a color argument, you add that after you write a comma in. So if I run this, you'll see that it's actually going to plot something. So ggplot has set some defaults. It's like, OK, you haven't specified a color, so we're going to go with black, classic. Um, you haven't specified you know, the uh, x-axis and y-axis label names, so we're just going to go with what the variable is called. So that's why it says d weight and d cubicles here instead of something more clean like average waiting time difference or average uh, number of cubicles, you know. So it says some defaults here based on the information that you've given it. And uh, I would say that this plot kind of gets the message across, you know, between the relationship of the number of cubicles and the waiting time. So we can see that the waiting time decreases as the number of cubicles increases, which makes a lot of sense. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Right. Um, and obviously, geom point was the right plot to go with this time because a scatter plot could visualize the relationships of these two variables very nicely. Whereas sometimes you might want a bar plot instead or a line plot or I don't know, like a, a, a box plot or something a bit more fancy. So you, it's up to you what shape you want to represent the data points. These are called geometric objects, which is why the, uh, the, the function name is called geom underscore point. And the AS, as I mentioned before, stands for aesthetic. So it's very much related to what visual attributes we want to give to the geom. There's also a size argument that I forgot to mention. That's also, you can also put it within the function and stuff like the X and the Y axis that we've already done, and the color, which I've also mentioned. So these are all related to the aesthetics. Right, and this is the code that we just did. So hopefully nobody has erred while doing that code. Cool. Any, any questions about what we've done so far, by the way? Uh, I had a question. Yeah, um, go for it. With uh, the whole with the, with using the plus sign, is that something that's like unique to like, ggplot? So anytime you want to do something to whatever whatever the data is you called in ggplot, you write plus and then you go down a line. Is that like mm. always how you do it? Yeah, it's unique to ggplot. Okay. Yeah, you wouldn't do that with other packages. Okay. It it Thank is you. unique. Yeah. Um. There are other there are packages that also there are other plotting packages that work with layers, but you wouldn't use plus. Sometimes you just put it all in the same function call, or you would separate it into pipes. So the pipe, the gg, uh, the mag magreter pipe is very popular in Tidyverse. It's essentially, looks like this. So you might see this sometimes when you're working with other packages or with dplyr. Actually, we'll be working with this a lot next week. So you'll see this a lot. And I will explain what that does next week. But yeah, there are some specific uh, operators, I think you would call this, 
with certain functions and that should all be mentioned in the documentation like it it's quite easy to just pull up as i said if you just do question mark ggplot you'll pull up the help page and then again most useful for me personally is just to scroll to the bottom where you see example uh code with it and you'll be able to see all the all the ways that the syntax is used if you're ever unsure yeah thank you no problem. Any other questions? All right, let's move on. Cool. So as I, I, I keep mentioning function, running a function essentially does something. A function will always do one certain thing. It will do one certain thing really well. Functions can either be given no inputs or they can be given several inputs um inputs essentially just means arguments like the x and the y and the data equals that we just did and as i said before they're separated by commas you can explicitly name arguments or you don't need to so i think the first time that i did the oops i went to sleep Okay, we're back. Yeah, so the first time I think I did the ggplot call without the data equals and it still worked fine. That is because by default, the first argument is the data argument. So, you know, it's kind of intelligent. It knows that the first thing that you put in is the data. But sometimes you do need to specify it because sometimes, uh, functions will have kind of optional arguments where there are like defaults set already. Again, that should be in the help page if you ever pull it up. But yeah, usually if an argument is not essential, then it will it will be preset with something. If it is essential, like the data argument, then it will expect your first or your second or your third argument to be those arguments because you need to input those arguments, otherwise the function will just not work. Yeah, other arguments like x and y are similar. So let's just try this real quick. If I remove the x equals, if I remove the y equals, and run that, it will still work. Let me broom clean this plot and then rerun it just to show you that it works. And again, this is because the aesthetic function expects the first and the second argument to be the X and the Y argument. If I were to do the opposite, like the weight instead, the Q equals, then you'll see the, you know, they're, they're flipped around. Because it then expects the, uh, yeah, it will always expect the X first and then the Y. Uh, yeah, aesthetic has two named arguments. So they're unspecified, but they will often revert to default values. That I just mentioned. Yep, so we just ran that, prove that it works. And this is just to show you, if we weren't doing geom underscore points, we could use geom bar or geom line, geom box plot, geom histogram. Those are all functions within the package. So now we can start layering some geoms together. We can do geom smooth, which is essentially, it's going to add a uh, kind of confidence interval. Is it? Let me just double check. Yeah, it's going to add that, and then it's going to add in a regression line. So if you just do gm underscore smooth, as uh, d cube equals again, and then d weight from that, and this belt be weight, adds in this kind of um, regression uh, level of confidence interval. 
Okay. Um, so yeah, that is an example of how we layer geoms on top of each other. And you can tell that, you know, we had to specify the aesthetic again. But you actually don't need to specify it twice like this because it is unchanged. You might want to specify it twice if you want the variables to be different. But in this case, the variables are the same. So what you can do instead of specifying it twice is you can specify it in the foundation layer, which is this, this line of code. So what you can do instead is add a comma here and then start typing the aesthetic thing again, the cubicles, and then wait. And then remove these because this is the foundation layer. So whatever is specified here is going to be the default for all the other layers on top of it. So let's just see if that works. Again, I misspelled it. <laughs> yeah, we can see that that creates the same exact result because everything in the foundation layer should be the default for future layers stacked on top of it. Yeah, and uh, I think that will start to. Yep, and you can further specify other arguments within GM Smooth, like method equals LM. You can just quickly do that now. So after you've done everything in the base layer, like I did, you can then specify additional arguments within GM Smooth that is unique to GM Smooth, such as method equals. LM and don't forget the quotation marks around LM because the argument method needs a string argument. String arguments essentially they're strings like text, uh, so they need to have quotation marks around them. T cubicles and weight are variable names, so they're kind of treated as objects or vectors within the capacity AE data frame. So you do not specify the quotation marks around these two because the because they're not really uh, independent text. They're more interpreted as like objects. But for method, we specify equals LM. We run this and we can see that our output changes so that the method has changed um, for the regression line. It's now linear uh, regression, I believe. So, and obviously you cannot specify this method in the base layer. I, I don't think you can, but we can try it just to see if it works. And you can see that that has not worked. It's just completely ignored it because we go back to how it was previously. If I remove this, I think it will do the same thing. So it's just ignored it because method is an argument that is specific to geom smooth function. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, so the slides also show you the result that you'd expect to see after that change in code. And then we can do some more things to customize the plot. Um, we can color it by whether the site has had a staff increase or not. So we can do that by specifying the additional color argument that I mentioned. Let's just do that now. So I'm just going to bring up the data set just to remind you there is an additional column for staff increase. True and false, very simple. So what we can do is because it's in the scatter layer, like we want to color the, uh, the dots, right? You can either specify the color variable within the aesthetic here. So you can open up another aesthetic and specify that you want to color it by, what is it called again? Staff increase, staff underscore increase. If I run that, you'll see that it's now colored it and there's now a legend on the side uh, specifying like whether it's true or false that there's been an increase. Or again, as I said, you can put it in the foundation layer. So within AES, you can then add in the color argument equals Staff increase. Oh, that's done something different. Actually, I just realized. Is it anything outside? No. Okay. So actually, 
point in that because you want to specifically just color, actually that makes sense. So let's just go back to um, explain what went wrong there. If you specify the color within the foundation layer, then you're saying that you want to color both the geom point and the geom smooth, which confuses the function a lot because it doesn't really make that much sense because the geom smooth layer doesn't really have that distinction between the two. Um, so what you want to do to keep your plot clean is make sure that whenever you're changing an aesthetic, make sure that you know where you want the change from. So just put it within geom point because that's the only layer that you want to change the color for. Staff increase. And that is much more of what you would expect. And you don't want to color the regression line or anything because that doesn't make sense. Also, one interesting thing that happens, just to let you know what happened there, okay. When you specify the color equals staff increase outside of the aesthetic, what it did is it did nothing. And that's because within the aesthetic function, there is a color argument. But within ggplot, as the foundation layer, it doesn't really know how to interpret this. So it does nothing. It's very nice that it did an error for you. Um, it just decided to ignore it. So that's what happened. Okay. That's the slides. Hmm. Okay. So the slides kind of go into one point that I forgot to mention. So yes, you can color it by whether there's been a staff increase or not. You can also, so I'm switching around a lot. Uh, some of you, if I'm doing this too quickly, don't worry. Uh, as long as you get my explanation, that's fine. If I remove the geom point again, if I then specify color equals red as a string, so not an object, it will, uh, oh, that is weird. Oh, sorry, it should be in the aesthetic. I keep messing that up because it will be ignored if it's outside of aesthetic. There you go. So you can also decide to color everything by just a color. So the color argument will also just accept a string. The string could be red, black, blue. So let's do, let's do blue. Uh, apparently it doesn't accept blue. It only accepts red. That's interesting to know. I usually don't color things by one color, but you can also accept a specific hash code. So if I Google this real quick, if you've got like an HTML color code that you want, like a specific shade, for example, like this. Again, you don't need to do this. I'm just showing you that it works. Like a specific hex code. And you run that, it will color it to, to, to that color as well. But that will work. You want to customize your layer. And obviously you can do this in the geom point layer or the geom smooth layer. They should all accept the color argument. Let me bring back normal plot. Okay. You can also do size. So again, there's a lot of arguments that you can use. Although size this po this, uh, this time is outside of the aesthetic, I think. Yeah, so you can specify the size equals four, which I think is a bit bigger. Or you can make it smaller, get into one. It'll be more compact. So size actually isn't in the aesthetic which to me doesn't make too much sense, but it is how the function is designed. Um, can, I, can I come in here? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think you can put it in start, inside the aesthetic, but it means that you basically- Oh yeah, it's a very- way that you can put color in there. And so your yeah. size would depend on whatever variable you call it. 
but if you put it outside you can like choose the size specifically yeah that's a very good point so if you put size within the aesthetic you'll see that the true are now much bigger than the falses so if you want your size to vary by a variable that's how you would do it but if you just want to control the overall size so that everything is size four then you put it outside of aesthetic Thanks so much for uh, reminding me of that. Cool. Let me just bring that back. Okay, and then it kind of talks about how you can move all the aesthetic calls into your global function, which is ggplot. Uh, and you can also do a facet wrap. So let's try the facet wrap. So instead of, I think we can add it on top of Geom Smooth. Add a plus and then a facet underscore wrap function call. So for this function, you need a squiggly line uh, and then the variable name that you want to facet by. So I think what can we fastify? We can fastify staff increase again. And that. And at this point, we don't really need the color distinction because they're separated into two facets based off of whether staff is increased. Um, but as you can see, another way to view a plot by different categories is by facets. So if you have for example, I mean, this data set is very simplified, but maybe if you had a different variable like geography and you want to see the change in multiple districts or multiple LSOAs or sites or GP surgeries, then you can use the facet wrap to, uh, to do that um, and still keep like the color distinction between the staff increase. But today we don't really have a column like that. I mean, we have site. But it's going to look very messy because there are so many. Yeah, so there's too many sites, so that does not look pretty. Maybe if it was on a very, very large document, I suppose, but I, I think you see what I mean. So that's facet wrap. And you can further specify how you want to present, uh, present the facet wrap. So there's an argument called n call. So you can specify n call equals one. What that will do is it will organize your facets into one column. So they'll be on top of each other instead of side by side. If it looks cleaner like this and you can specify n call equals one, or if you've got like a lot of geographies in your facet wrap, you wanna split into like three columns, that's how you would do it. You know, um, it is a case by case kind of thing. There's also n row, I believe. So you can do them all in the same row as well. And you can have both n row and n call in the same uh, in the same function, giving you uh, full power of uh, how you want to customize the view. Okay, any questions so far about what we've covered? Could you possibly go through the facet wrap one more time? The facet wrap? Yes, yeah. please. Okay. So for example, if you don't want to use the color, I think that'll make the point a little bit more clearer. If you don't want the color, you want to separate uh, how the data looks like with a staff increase and how the data looks like without a staff increase, just want to use the facet wrap then you can do that. So this facet is just for uh, non-staff increase, sites with a non-staff increase. And the second facet is for sites with a staff increase. And using this function, you can kind of spot differences between the two groups. So it's just another option for you to change your data visual and separate your plot into like two mini plots. Some people would prefer that. Also, if you've got a data set that has 
more variables like geography, you might want to see how the plot looks like in different geographies or in different GP surgeries, how like the trend changes and whatnot, you can spot the change. So facet wrap again, once you specify the function, just make sure that the first argument is the uh, variable that you want to facet by, and that would be staff increase in this case. If you want to, mm, it's a shame that there aren't more options here, but I think I loosely use site and kind of worked. But yeah, the first argument will be the variable in your data set that you want to facet by. So site is a unique ID, so we shouldn't do that, but that's just to get the point across. And then facet wrap has an end call where you can specify the number of columns. So if you specify the end call equals one, then the facets will be stacked on top of each other because it will want it will it will try to keep the number of facet columns to one. You can also specify n row equals two, which will give the same result because there are now two rows. Um, the exact opposite of this would be n call equals two and n row equals one, where it will be next to each other. And you can customize this. Actually, if I do the site one, that will be a better example. I do a site and call, I want three and and row, I'll just let it vary. And then as you can see, it successfully uh, separated all of the sites into three columns. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I think we've got just a few slides left. So with any luck, we might finish early today, get an earlier lunch. Um, I'm sure that's great news to everybody. Uh, right, so let's have a look at another research question. How are weight values distributed? We kind of want to see if it's like an even, a normal distribution or if it's skewed one way or another. Um, so one good way of doing this is to plot a histogram instead. So again, it's just another geom call. I feel like at this point, you must probably be well acquainted with how that would work. So instead of, actually, I shouldn't remove code like this. I'll just keep it and I'll just make another plot. So ggplot, again, capacity, AE, static, two cubicles, and then weight plus this time we can do geom underscore histogram in the bracket and then aesthetic again we always have to have the aesthetic actually maybe this time we don't need no we do need it because there's only uh there's one if we don't do this it might look a little bit buggy or there's a risk that it'll be buggy yeah it's cubicles yeah it's it's error because histogram um all you're doing with the histogram is just viewing one variable so if you give it two variables like here it's it's not going to know what to do because it doesn't know which one of these variables you want to plot so for geom histogram you actually don't want to have the aesthetics here you just want one variable given so i think in this case we want to see the waiting time we just given uh, aesthetic and then the D weight variable, and then I will plot the distribution of that variable in a histogram plot. So we can see this is kind of a normal distribution. There's definitely a bit of a skew um, to the right, but it's hard to say because this data set is so small. So that kind of answers the question. We can make it a bit more viewable because, if, as you can see, um, the bins are quite large. So we can, let me just check if this is within aesthetics. Yeah. 
spin equals 10. Let's see if that improves. Oh, it is within. All right, so spin equals 10. Oh, it's been with. I was right the first time. Spin with equals 10. I wouldn't say that's an improvement, but it does force it to look more normal, doesn't it? Um, and also, just in case it's helpful, you kind of switch between the plots that you've done before and after. If you want to compare two plots, you can click on these arrows to go back and forth because uh, our studio will keep kind of a, a history of your most recent plots. Obviously, if you start a new session and a new R Studio project, then you won't have access to that history. So you can't always do this. But if you're in the same session, you should be able to kind of go back and forth and see the different plots that you've done. OK, so yeah, bin width is another argument to the geom histogram function. Now, if you want to see the number of attendances by site, site being kind of the unique identifier of this data set, we can look at, uh, we can use a bar plot to visualize that for the uh, number of attendances for each site. So to do this, we can use geom call. There's also geom bar, but for this example, we're using geom call for some reason. We can use both to see which one looks better, actually. Um, okay, let's use geom call for now. So let's start a new plot. I'm just going to copy and paste the first line. Geom call, and then within aesthetic, we do need to put in both an X and Y. So I think we're looking at attendance. Just call it attendance 2018. So site and then attendance 2018. Yeah. So I think the distinction between geom call and geom bar is the, yeah, so it, it's interpreted a bit differently. So I think geom bar, um, the bars are, actually geom call is kind of like a histogram except so geom call is very similar to geom histogram except that it accepts two variables um so it needs an x and a y axis but it still kind of shows you like the distribution by the two variables whereas i think with geom bar uh you do use it for a different case so here um you got site on the x axis and then you can see that attendances vary around by site which is useful to know if uh, that is the question that your colleague has asked of you. Let's see what else we've got. We can reorder the site by attendances, which I think makes a lot of sense. So you might want to see the sites with the most attend with the most average attendance. I think it's average attendance in the year. Um, so on one side, the sites with the most the other side that sends with the least. So we can do that by uh, using this reorder function in either the X or the Y axis. So let's do it with the X. And I just specify X equals. Deferring. Oh, yeah. So you need to, sorry, the reorder function needs two arguments. So you need to reorder the site by something. So you would reorder it by the attendance, uh, attendance 2018. And then it'll actually show you. What this is saying is that you want to plot the x axis by site, but first you want to reorder it. Uh, re you want to reorder the site variable by the number of attendances. So that way you get this nice ascending plot, even though it's kind of messy. 
Um, and you can see that the site numbers are all scrambled because they're ordered by something different. It's ordered by attendance instead of the numeric site number. It's probably more useful if you had less sites and if the sites each had like an actual name attached to it so that it makes more sense from a visual point of view. Okay, we can also try a box plot using the geom box plot call. Again, it accepts uh, the X and Y, and then we have an additional labs layer. So labs is nice to mention because at this point you kind of want to clean your plot, right? So we can actually add it to the geom call one. So if you do a plus labs, labs is just short for labels. You open the labs and then you specify the title is uh, sites by 2018 attendance. If you just run that, you'll see that it's added the title, very much expected. And then you can also clean the X and Y label. So if you specify X equals attendance in 2018, run that, you'll see that the uh, X axis label now looks much more legible. Do the same for the Y label. Oh, sorry. Should be site number for X. And then attendance in 2018 is the Y axis label. I think that is much more interpretable. And you can do that for all the previous plots as well. So just to demonstrate the box plot, I'm going to copy and paste this code. And it said the geom call, I'm going to do geom box plot. And we're still going to do the site and attendance, I believe. Or maybe I think it would be cleaner if we did. I'm just going to erase everything. I think it would be much cleaner if we did the box plot by staff increase. Is that the example they used? Yeah, staff increase and waiting time. Okay. X equals staff increase. Y equals E wait. And then obviously the title needs to be changed. X and Y variable needs to be changed. So the Y is now staff increase. Up oh, X. Staff increase. The Y is average waiting time. The title is average waiting time by staff increase. Now that plot looks much more neat. If you want even neater, this isn't mentioned in the slides, but you can add in a pre-built uh, template called geom theme minimal, which I like to use. And it just kind of removes that gray background. So it looks like a little bit more uh, clean. And obviously there's, there's other things that you can uh, look up uh, I'm sure if you Google the ggplot documentation, you'll see a bunch of other preset themes. You can also set your own theme in a way by modifying the um, the preset visuals using another function. Um, I think we might go through that. No, apparently not. Okay. So let me just ggplot a theme. There's a specific function. It's called theme. And you've got all of these arguments that you can use to further customize your plot. You can modify the background color, the, the spacing of the X and the Y axis, the grids, how the legend looks. You can place the legend at the top, at the bottom. Um, you can modify how the legend looks. You can modify the uh, axis line, the ticks, you know, they're very specific, like detailed things. All these things you can change using the, the theme 
function. Um, we're not really going to go into it much because at this point it is just up to you and experimentation. There's really not a lot of uh, difficulty in doing it. It's just kind of you trying it out and seeing what you like best or just following some kind of organizational template that you already have. So just to let you know that you can further customize the ggplot using this theme function. And this is the ggplot2 uh, online documentation. So they've got information on every function in the package and all of these descriptions and examples for you to look at. So just to let you know that that's there. Okay, I think we're at the end of the slide deck. Uh, it just goes into how you can save your plot now. So GG save, I'm not sure how well it works in Posit Cloud, but I'm just going to try it, see if it works. For GG save, let me just try it just to see if it works. You don't need to do, do this right now. Mm -mm. Doesn't seem to work. PNG. Okay, it works. It just gives you an error message, even though it worked. I think that's what happened the last time I tried it in Posit Cloud. There are some specifics with using Posit Cloud that are not as good as using it. Um, in your local R. But in your local R, you should be able to do this and it won't give you an error message. In Posit Cloud, you'll get an error message, but it seems to have done that anyway. Uh, although it's not... Oh, maybe that's why the error message happened because it didn't save it properly. Because it definitely does not look like that. Okay, so in Posit Cloud, there are some minor issues with GG save, which I don't find to be a big problem because whenever I create visuals uh, in R, I either screenshot it or I export it using, okay. So there are a few options that you can do instead of using GG save. GG save is always there. If it works for you, then you can use GG save. Um, if it doesn't, then you can try what I'm about to explain. So once you have your GG plot, you can either use your screenshot tool, screenshot this, put it into the report, um, or if you're doing an automatic, automated report in R anyway, using R Markdown, which we'll go through next week, you can just put the ggplot object within your automated report code, and then it will get saved in the HTML or in the Word doc file or in the PDF that you've made anyway. So it doesn't even need to be screenshot in the first place. Like there should be no manual work if you're doing an automated report in R. But if you're coding just so that you can get a quick plot so that you can put it into like a PowerPoint, then you can screenshot it or you can use this button here, the export button, save as image. Um, so example plot, the file name, save it. And then you'll have it in your working directory at the, at the bottom because that's the newest thing. So if I open that, now that looks fine. Um, GG save doesn't really work in Posit Cloud, but I find that, you know, there's more than enough ways to make up for it. So yeah, that's how you can save your plot that you just made. And honestly, I don't really do this often because most of my work is, uh, in an automated report or dashboard anyway. So I just include the ggplot code in there. And then once I render the report or the dashboard, then it'll be in there in its kind of original state without all the bugginess of ggsave. Okay, I think that is the, oh, one, one last thing, I guess one last thing. If you're using the export function, just make sure that, um, because the export function will take your plot based off of how it currently looks on your window, it might look different from your colleague if they did it because they might have a smaller monitor or they might have our studio kind of on a side window so it's more squished. Or because you can, as you can see, you can modify the different windows 
that will affect how your plot looks. Like your plot will naturally stretch to fit how you've adjusted it. So before you do this export, I would just make sure that you've adjusted it into the right size that you like before you do it, because then that will affect it. And also you can modify it using these arguments here regarding the width and the height. And I think these work in pixels, not centimeters, in case you're curious. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the last thing I wanted to add. Oh, and the, the width and the height arguments are available. If ggsave does work for you, then you can specify the, uh, the width and the height there. So there's a width argument and there's a height argument. There's also a CPI argument, which if you know, um, if you know what CPI is, I think it's something, something per inch, dimension per inch. It basically controls the quality of your plot. So if you want really high quality, mm -hmm. at least 300. Further than that, it's like HD quality. Um, but yeah, I would advise not going lower than 300 if you're using GPSafe and you're using the DPI argument. I think it's dots per inch, is it? Dots per inch. Yeah, that sounds about right. That does make sense because each pixel is essentially a, a, a dot. So it's, it has to do with um, how compact you want those pixels in an image. The more compact, the better the quality, I think. So that's why you want the DPI to be higher. Okay, yeah, that's the end of the slide. Any questions about GGplot? Um, I wanted to ask, if you wanted to know if, uh, for a formula, what all yeah. the, like, the inputs are, um, I think that we can adjust for like a specific plot. Is that all in the, in the help or guidance for that formula or is there other places you need to look? Mm. Yeah. Good question. So yes, it is in the guidance. As I said, there's a, um, if you just do the question mark followed by labs, press enter, you will see it. Um, the arguments will be under the usage section. So you'll be able to see all the possible arguments under here. Um, you can also press a shortcut key. So when you're in the function, you can press, I think it was tab. Yeah. If you press the tab key on your keyboard, there will have some suggested arguments for you, which is a very nice, like, quick way to see them. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, yeah, and very helpfully, they have a description next to each argument. So I would highly recommend using the, the uh, tab option. Any other questions? All right, so I think that's no, and I think everybody is keen to finish five minutes early, um, which I think is, is pretty good because we covered so many things today. Um, there is technically another slide deck that I want to go through, but I feel like I've covered everything in it because it essentially is about how to find information about the function, which is using the, uh, the question mark as I said, and obviously Googling, just Google everything. Like I've been working with R for five or more years and I just still Google sometimes when I'm unsure. I Google if there's a function that can do what I want, I Google what the function does. And there are so many smarter people on the internet that have gone through the same issue and I found a solution. So when in doubt, if you're ever uh, confused or if you ever want to know something, just Google it. Um, a lot of people use R mostly related to data science. So yeah, there's there's a lot of information out there. And obviously the Slack channel as well. Yeah. Which I can give you the link to now. If you just wait a second, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And I'll end the session by sharing the invite to the NHSR Slack channel that I've plugged quite a few times already.
uh, invite. Right, I just sent comments about accessing the recording. Do you know the answer to that? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think I would ask Bianca after this. And I also don't know if they're going to be uploaded after next week's session. So, yeah, I, I'm not sure if it'll be uploaded earlier than that. But once it's uploaded, I'm sure that Bianca will send everybody an email. But yeah, I'll, I'll make a note to ask her about it. The future sessions that you're doing, I think I had to go on the wait list for a few of them. Just uh, what ideally what what would build on this for next sessions? So I think you're signed up for next week's session, right? Because it is the the same course. But if you're referring to like the interactive plotting, for example, or any other workshops in NHSR, I think worth asking if they're going to be recorded and uploaded on YouTube. If not, I'm sure if you go on the Slack channel and ask for some free resources, there'll be many people that are willing to help um, send you the right way. For Personally, for the interactive plotting session that I mentioned, my course is free to view on GitHub. Like All the materials are on there, all the slides, all the code is readily done there. So you can kind of run it on your own without me explaining through it. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in, in that, I can send you the link. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. That'd be really helpful. Okay. Yeah. Um, and would any, you say, any, yeah. would you, would you say, I mean, getting your head around this is, it probably seems a bit of a trial and error, just practice in the environment and try to understand, you know, different kind of concepts of, of how you can go about using this, right? Yeah, it is it is trial and error, as you said. Um, when I when I first started, I was a, a bit rusty as well. I mainly used uh, the Tidyverse packages. I think when you're first starting off, Tidyverse packages is a great starting point. And then you can start experimenting with other packages depending on what you need. I think our markdown is probably the most useful tool when you're starting off because you can make automated reports that contain plots, tables, automated text, all those cool visuals that we're going to cover next week. And then I think the next steps after you're comfortable with our markdown is to make our markdown dashboards, which have like a more horizontal view. You can put in like filters, drop down menus and shiny applications, which are an additional level of reactivity that actually need to be hosted on a website. There are also like blogs that you can make and books that you can make, like online versions of books that you can make using uh, R and yeah, more advanced modeling. I think those, those kinds of things are also more advanced. I would say intermediate level R is when you're doing your own functions. So those functions that we've talked about that we downloaded from packages, you can actually make your own. So if you have like a set of tasks that you know, like maybe there's like a formula or like a model that you already do in your work, you can functionize that. And then you can send that function code to the rest of your team and they can use that same piece of code to run the same like model. So you can functionize that stuff like that. And you can do stuff like for loops. So you can loop through an action like 50 times or something. Um, so I would look into those as well. That's great. Thank you. No worries. Cool. Um, if no other questions, thank you all so much for attending the session. I know it's been a lot of information, but the fact that you've shown up and stayed until the end is already a testament. So well done. And we will continue with more uh, data cleaning stuff next week, which I think is my personal favorite. And I'll introduce you to our markdown, which is very, very useful tool. So we can look forward to that next week. Thank you, everyone. And um, hopefully see you next week. Thanks. That was great. Thank you. See you next Thanks week. very much, Annie. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.